welcome to the Democracies College podcast series. This podcast focuses on educational equity, justice, and excellence for all students in P-20 educational pathways. The podcast is a product of the Office of Community College Research and Leadership, or OCCRL, at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Learn more about OCCRL at occrl.illinois.edu. In this episode, Chiquita Brown of OCCRL talks with Kate Danielson of the organization Foster Progress, as well as with Anna Wandke and Tricia Wagner of Rock Valley College in Rockford, Illinois. The group discusses how to cultivate a foster-friendly culture at Illinois community colleges. Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Chiquita Brown, your host for this episode of Democracy's College podcast. Today, we will talk about what it means to cultivate a foster-friendly culture on community college campuses. And I am so excited to have with me three amazing women, Kate Danielson, Anna Wanke, and Trisha Wagner. But before we get started with our discussion, let's take a moment to have the ladies introduce yourselves. Let's start with you, Kate. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, Yeah, my name is Kate Danielson, and I'm the founder and executive director of Foster Progress, where our mission is to help youth from foster care to become successful adults, especially by helping them to achieve in higher education. So kind of our banner program is the mentoring and scholarship program, where we're matching youth who are in high school who have experienced foster care with a one-on-one mentor who helps them to finish high school strong and navigate that path to college. And they earn scholarship money through their participation in the program. They earn $100 every time they meet with their mentor. So that's Foster Progress. We have a couple of other great programs too, but that was the one that got us started. Anna, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Anna Wandke, and I'm the Perkins Coordinator at Rock Valley College. The Perkins Grant is a federal grant for career and technical education. So we do a lot of things to ensure that we have equipment that is industry standard, that we're providing professional development for our CTE faculty. But the part that's near and dearest to my heart is that we have certain special populations that we are working to remove barriers so that they can access high-wage, high-demand jobs. And one of the special populations are students who have aged out of foster care. And to that end, we have some amazing people who have been working in a work group in order to make these things happen. And Trisha is the leader of one of those groups. Hi, yeah, I'm Tricia Wagner. I am the Director of Adult Education. So I oversee the English as a Second Language programs, Adult Basic Education and GED Preparation, Adult Secondary, and some transition programs. And I think I've been on the Perkins Group for the last eight years and maybe about five years ago, four years ago, took the lead of Anna's subcommittee on foster serving individuals with experience in foster care. Great. Thank you for those introductions. And I am so excited about this conversation with you all today because this is such an important topic. And I know that this content will be a great resource for our listeners. I want to jump back into something Kate mentioned. You talked about the work that you're doing with Foster Progress. And I know you have made some great strides in the Chicago area just with the work that you're doing. But what I want to know is why do you feel like the work with Foster Progress is overlapped with education and students going to college? Why is earning a college education so important for foster youth? Such a great question. You know, the outcomes for youth as they age out of foster care are typically pretty poor. And we're finding that much higher proportions of this population experiencing homelessness and unemployment and incarceration, among some other really difficult circumstances. So a college education, I believe, is still really the best way in our society for students to have that economic mobility and to become independent and successful adults. And yet it's a really difficult journey and it's not one that we are meant to travel on our own. You know, finishing high school, getting into college, pursuing that post-secondary degree, it's not a solo activity. I have high school students now, my own children are in high school, 
And I'm doing a lot to help them navigate this, you know, in terms of going to college fairs and going on college visits and lots of conversations about what do you want to be? What do you want to pursue? What do you want to study? And so for youth in care, they don't have that person like in a typical family, you know, a caring, trusted adult who is having those conversations on a regular basis, starting early and then seeing them through there's so much to do. There's so many forms to fill out applications. It's complicated. Even as I was starting foster progress and learning all the ins and outs of dealing with the FAFSA and the IRS and financial aid and these institutions, it was a lot to learn for me as, you know, a woman with a master's degree who, you know, English is my primary language and I had a typical family growing up. So it's a lot for me to learn myself and to expect that foster youth with not much of a social network or a supportive family structure would be able to do it on their own. That's just asking too much of them. And so that's why foster progress is so important. You know, you brought up a great point. I remember just being a first gen struggling with trying to navigate college and understanding how to college and the benefit of having those resources in addition to family. And so I completely understand that. I would imagine that Trisha, you and Anna have you know, encountered students who struggled with understanding how to navigate college life. And so I would love for you all to just talk about this connection between the work Kate is doing with Foster Progress and even students in the community at large. Where does Rock Valley come in at that? We have a nonprofit and we have a community college. So where does this connection come in at with what you're trying to accomplish for college students with youth and care experience? I think that seeing the GED adult basic ad ESL populations, you know, one of our jobs is to make sure that they don't just get those skills, but that they are prepared to transition to post-secondary if they would like and see some success in post-secondary. And so we're kind of in the situation often of working with students who don't have some of those kind of built-in supports and structures that Kate was referring to that others may have. And so the, the idea of someone struggling because of barriers or because of, you know, lack of preparedness or just because of life situations isn't really new to us. And so embracing the individuals that have experience in foster care is very natural as a way to just try to help individuals in our community connect with post-secondary. And I remember when our vice president, Amanda Smith, originally was forming these subcommittees, this is years and years ago, when she asked me to take the lead, I remember having a wonderful conversation conversation about wouldn't it be great if we could just cast the vision that individuals with experience in foster care, if it's recent, if it's been a while, they can find their way to our institution and they can go from care to college. You know, they can go from a place where there are not a lot of safety nets, not a lot of options, and they can find themselves in training programs and transfer programs in the community college offer so much in terms of supportive programs that sort of shepherd students through the program and then help them with employment at the end. And I just remember getting this great vision. You know, of course, at the time, I think I was thinking a lot about if there were youth in our GED program or in our ASL program as well, you know, that had experience in foster care. But just thinking about how marvelous it would be to go from the place where they are to a place where they can be self-sustaining or family sustaining in a relatively short period of time, a semester to a year, just imagining that option being presented to them and our college being able to come around them while they make that journey and then finding themselves in a place where they do have the safety net, they do have the support. That is great. And you also talked about sometimes our students with foster care backgrounds could be right under our nose and we don't even know it. And so just being aware of some of those challenges that they would face, but also how our resources could best benefit them to really increase educational attainment in their pursuit for college and career success, right? I want to jump into something that Anna mentioned when you gave your introduction. 
You said as the Perkins coordinator, you work with special populations to help them access high skill, high demand, high wage jobs. For our listeners who may not be familiar with that language, can you explain what is meant by a special population and what is the benefit or the importance of those high skill, high demand, high wage jobs specifically for special populations like college students with foster care experience? Absolutely. So under the Perkins five law, there are nine different special populations. And these are groups of people who traditionally have had barriers in their way to accessing high wage, high demand jobs. And that differs Chiquita by area. So part of what Perkins has to do is we have to do a comprehensive local needs assessment and we need to determine what those high wage, high demand jobs are for our area. So at different places in Illinois, they may have different high wage, high demand jobs, but in our area, it's manufacturing, it's healthcare. There are a variety of them. And these special populations They range from students who are single parents to English language learners. One that maybe is less coming to the top of people's head are students who are non-traditional by gender. So for example, females going into occupations where their gender is less than 25% of the folks who are in that field. So it could be female welders, it could be male respiratory therapists. There are several of them. And one of the populations is students aging out of foster care. And that's one of the ones that was added most recently. That's not one of the original populations. I believe that was added in 2019. So foster care and homeless students experiencing both of those. Those were the recent additions. And part of what we have to do is we have to gather data. We're mandated to gather data on the students that we have that fall into these populations. How many do we have? And we have certain performance indicators that we need to meet as far as success for these students, as far as completions, as far as the percentage of non-traditional students going into the different programs. So it's a great great part of the Perkins grant. They're so invested in equity, not that our campus needed to be forced, but it really pushes the needle on making sure that students with these special needs get these special needs and get the funding to ensure that those barriers are removed for them. Thank you for giving us that foundational information, because I think that's important as we jump into the depth of what we want to talk about today, which is cultivating this foster friendly campus culture. And what does that really mean? for not only the faculty, the staff, but the college students who have cost of care experience that will be on our campus. And so can you talk about what does it mean to have a foster friendly campus culture and why is this necessary for students who have foster care background? So recently, I think this was in 2021, Judy Havlicek and Amy Dworsky and Alyssa Glitka published a research brief about how we can improve the post-secondary educational outcomes of students in foster care in community colleges. And one of the main findings that they published was about how college students really want their institutions to know about them and their particular needs and to just be prepared to be able to support them better. And so Rock Valley and specifically Trisha reached out to Foster Progress for, I think initially you just had some questions maybe about like students that you knew of. And then I let her know, you know, that we offer these trainings and she took me up on it. So we just finished yesterday, the third of three trainings with Rock Valley folks. And I was just so impressed with them because they're clearly a group of people that's really dedicated to learning and equipping themselves to be as supportive as possible to all of these special populations and foster youth in particular. So we did three trainings. You know, the hope is that This will give them some context for what foster youth have been through, and then some of the best practices that we recommend for how to best support them while they're in college and how to make sure that they not only can enter into the college setting, but that they can succeed and then ultimately graduate or earn some kind of a certificate or transfer on to a four-year institution. Yeah. And just adding on to that, I remember when I first reached out to Kate, I had heard about the mentorship program that they offer. And so I was just curious about like, you know, if we run across someone, what are their guidelines, you know, just that kind of thing. 
she had educated me about her services, you know, that certainly that also the scholarships, the advocacy, their work, and then staff development. I have an email from Kate that says, you know, we have these three trainings helping serve foster youth with trauma-informed care, promoting the success of foster youth in post-secondary and then financial aid for individuals with experience in foster care. And I just about fell out of my chair because I just thought this is exactly what we need. You know, those topics are going to hit all of the high notes for what we we're trying to do to wrap our heads around how we can make our community college a welcoming and supportive environment for this specific special population. So let's say a college or a community college was looking to implement strategies to create this culture that's friendly for students with foster care experience. What should or could they do to cultivate that type of environment on campus based off of what you all are doing over at Rock Valley? What are some tips? Well, you know, it's really wonderful to have the Perkins because it gives us a structure and, you know, funding backing and, you know, just the ability to have a focus on these special populations. I think, you know, without that focus, it's easy to say, oh, we know some students are underprepared. What are we going to do as an institution? And then you have really general strategies, but maybe not something that really hits a particular population. So the fact that we can focus in on specific populations is really wonderful. I think the education piece is really important because of our foster youth group, there's actually a number of us that have some sort of connection with foster care. My father was in adopted and in foster care. We have a staff member who she's fostered many, many children as she's raised her family. So we have some individuals with some experience, but whenever it comes down to, okay, let's see how we can help these students succeed in post-secondary we really needed some teaching. So we need teaching on these topics that Kate presented. We needed to connect with our local foster care, foster youth serving agencies, which was huge because they're kind of our lighthouses now to say, okay, this is where you need to head. This is what our needs are. This is how we can partner. And we have the National Youth Advocate Program in Rockford. Of course, DCFS is a player, Lutheran Social Services and Children's Home and Aid. And thankfully, we have an agency, I believe it's through NIU, the RACME, Rockford Area Case Managers Initiative. And it's a wonderful group that provides training and professional development on particular topics about how to improve, align, you know, make more efficient, you know, case management services throughout many, many social service organizations in Rockford. And I approached the leader of that organization to say, hey, is there any chance you guys could ever do something on foster youth? We just really need to learn and they were wonderful. They took us up on that and provided a community of practice panel focusing on foster care. So they invited these agencies and we had a wonderful discussion. So not only did we learn from them, but we also are now connected with them. So I think that that education connection to your local service providers is really important. And then when it comes down to like actually implementing the strategies we found, and this is true probably for many populations in Perkins, but you know, having active communication with faculty and staff about the initiatives that are taking place, about responses, data tracking is super important because, you know, to identify individuals and then having the services identified, you know, your college may offer lots and lots and lots and lots of services but having them actually identified for, okay, these are the services that we think could really help someone who is aging out of foster care or has experience in foster care. And so when we do come across that student, there's a plan. You know, we don't just generally refer them to the general services, but we can say, hey, this is what we know you may benefit from the most. And we can sort of provide more informed, intelligent navigation for them. That was really good. And you said so much in response to that question. And one of the things I appreciate the most about your approach is the individualized, really targeting youth in care to provide services that would meet them. One of the things that having worked in higher ed, it's very easy to kind of lump all first gen, low income together. And if we're not careful, we will try to meet them based off of what traditional first gen and <laughs> you know what I mean? And we know that those needs are completely different 
And so many things can get missed if we only use those larger, broader labels to support our youth and care on campus. And so I'm curious, with the work that you all are doing, you talked about communicating with staff and faculty. How receptive have they been or are they to this idea of we want Rock Valley to be known as the place where we can encourage and strengthen and support current and former youth in care, their college and aspirations? We want to be that place. Yeah. Was that well received? I mean, they are enthusiastic, they are supportive, they are participatory, they have great ideas. One interesting outcome that I didn't plan on from the presentations that Kate did is it just gave us the opportunity, you know, to put in our Rock Valley Daily News email, you know, multiple times, you know, hey, we've got this foster progress organization that's going to come and provide teaching. Just announcing that that was going on created a flood of emails from our faculty to me saying, this is so cool. I'm so glad you're doing this. Have you seen this article? And it sort of created a buzz or a conversation. We had one faculty member join our committee. I think she had kind of at the same time come across the need and was very interested as well. You know, it kind of created an inroad for that. So I guess active activities, having activities going on on campus gives a forum for the conversations to happen. That was really, really cool. So I think some of what we can do is just kind of keep the conversation going and we've got some fun plans up our sleeve for what we're going to be doing over the next year or so. You know, we've got planned out about that far, but it's been really wonderful. And of course, the staff and of course, the administration are also extremely supportive of Perkins and supportive of these initiatives. They love the equity angle, of course, that this brings. So we're very excited to see the response that we've gotten. College as a whole wants to be an institution that embraces, you know, individuals with experience in foster care. Now, what about the students? Because I know Kate can attest to this too. Sometimes just being open to receive support is a struggle or even the idea of self-disclosing that foster care background is a challenge for some. And so when we talk about creating this foster-friendly environment, part of that, you know, how it will work is the students must be willing to, in some ways, identify with that label. And so how are the students responding to this idea? And what would campuses need to do to increase their comfort with wearing that label proudly and getting the support that they need in order to self-disclose that information to get the support that they need. Yeah, I'll start off by saying a couple of things and then we have something really cool that Anna's going to share. But I would say Rock Valley is just now implementing a CRM, a customer relations management software that will help us in many ways with recruitment, with tracking who our individuals are, having some processes that can take place when a student does self-identify or disclose like at a time of admission or that kind of thing. I would say colleges having the ability to kind of find the students is really important because they don't always speak up and say. We have many kind of anecdotal stories about having more students in a population than we knew. The other thing is with our foster care, you know, serving agencies in the area, you know, one of my goals is to build such a working relationship with them that we kind of know them and maybe their youth, or at least through them, their youth, so that when their students come to us, there's already a relationship. Like they know RVC, like we're part of that extended family. I think that is going to help with self-disclosure because students will feel like, you know, they'll be delivered to an institution that they're already familiar with. They already will have heard about. They already will know some things about it based on the discussions that may have been happening in their foster home or with their caseworker. Yeah. And I wanted to share an email that just came at 1030 last night. And it was from one of our people who work at the foundation, which provides scholarships and emergency funding for students. And she has been attending the foster progress sessions. And she sent an email just saying how grateful she was for Kate's teaching and all of this and how it really raised her awareness. And she said, she's not sure if it's just because her awareness is raised, or if this is in fact the first time that in her review, of scholarship applicants, she had someone disclose that they were from a foster care background. So if you don't mind, I'll just read the quote that she provided from the student. 
So the student said, it would really help me out because I am a child in foster care. And to see that I've accomplished such measures would not only shine light on me, but show other kids who are a part of the system that they are able to have dreams and desires and that they are able to achieve them. I mean, what an amazing testament to what can happen, right? If a student has that wraparound support, has the financial safety net that can allow them to be able to pursue their dreams. So, I mean, that was just a divine coincidence that that came when it did, but I wanted to share that particularly with you, Kate, because what you're doing is making a difference and it's just so rewarding to hear. That's amazing. That happened so fast. (laughs) What a coincidence. That's great. And I love the timing of it, right? We did not set this up. <laughs> no, no. And I think it's a great segue into a question that I think is necessary to ask because Kate, you're doing this work with Rock Valley and you've been doing this work in the community for a while. You are a fierce advocate and just your work speaks for itself. Are there opportunities to partner with other community colleges and the benefit of this training? How can this continue to spread throughout the state of Illinois, not only at community colleges, but maybe potentially at four year institutions? What's the value there? Yeah, I think there's tremendous value. I think, you know, you had asked Trisha and Anna, like how the faculty responded at Rock Valley. And I think their experience has been pretty typical. When people think about foster kids, they usually think about little kids, they think about children. I taught a workshop once to some caseworkers and we brought some adults who had experienced foster care when they were kids to share their experiences. And one of the caseworkers said, I'm so glad you guys came. I feel embarrassed admitting this, but I never think about the fact that these kids are gonna be adults someday. And I was just like, oh no, this is something we need to change. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, I'm thinking for my children all the time about what they're going to become when they're adults and preparing them for adulthood. And so I think that's something that we need to change in the system. It's like, we can't just keep these kids safe for now. We have to be thinking about their future. And so I say that in the context of, you know, the higher education institutions, I think that we forget that these children are now, you know, they're becoming adults and they're on our campuses and they've been through a lot, you know, a lot of loss, a lot of trauma. And if we can get the word out and inform the college faculty and staff about these young people some of their common experiences, the ways that trauma impacts them and their educational outcome, then, you know, we can better equip our institutions to care for them and to help them succeed. You know, there's some really important efforts going on and conversations going on right now. Foster progress is pretty small. And so we have had just kind of one-off opportunities like this one with Rock Valley to teach and to get in front of their audiences. But I'm always trying to take every opportunity from every college or university that's interested. And as soon as foster youth are brought to their attention, without any variation, like every single time, they're very willing and excited to learn and want to help. They want to learn, they want to help this population succeed. And so I think there is a need for it and desire for it. A couple of years ago, there was a bill passed that now requires all public colleges to have what's called a house liaison. And that is a person who is the liaison for both homeless and foster youth. Ever since that bill passed and then those house liaisons started to be identified at these different institutions, I've definitely seen like an increase in the desire for training and education on this population. So, you know, for example, there's a big conference every summer called College Changes Everything. And usually when I teach at that conference, I'll have like 10 people participate in my workshops, but this year it was 60 people. Mm -hmm. So I just think like this population is becoming sort of elevated in the mind of the faculty and staff on campuses. So there's a new awareness and a new desire for that training. Thanks for sharing that. And I agree, there is a heightened awareness around this population and it's necessary because for so long, youth and care have been an invisible population on campus. And so it's definitely necessary to have these conversations and to provide the resources that faculty, staff, practitioners, and even caseworkers that they could use as something to go to as 
you know, let me help this student. How can I help this youth transition from care to college, career, and beyond? And the resources are there, but sometimes people don't know where to look. And so this work is important. We also know that research indicates that youth in care are more likely to matriculate at community colleges at a higher rate than four-year institutions. And with that comes its own challenges because most community colleges they typically don't offer housing and with foster youth that are transitioning from care, housing can definitely be an issue. And so how can community colleges leverage trainings like this to increase the awareness of some of those needs to support students? And what are some of those potential barriers they need to be aware of when we're saying, hey, come here, we have this foster friendly campus but we know you might be facing this challenge, this challenge, this challenge. So can you talk about some of those challenges and what community colleges need to do to be prepared as we are learning to identify these students more and more? Yes, as you said, you know, we don't have dorms at Rock Valley College, but I think that in a way, dorms are not necessarily a solution because as Kate has made us well aware, there are breaks and there are summers and then where are these students going to go? You know, the dorms are not available to them at that time. So I really think that community colleges are just a fantastic platform for these students to step out into their next best life because as they have housing needs, we have a homeless liaison on campus who's working with the community. Here in Rockford, we have the continuum of care. And so she's connecting the students who have housing needs with maybe a more permanent solution, you know, not just sort of a stopgap measure during the semester, but providing them with housing assistance that can then, you know, be something that they're able to grow from. You know, in the same way, our campus doesn't have childcare on campus. I wish we did, but what we do have is a working relationship with the local YWCA and their childcare solutions. So we're able to refer students over there and they're able to work with them about what the realistic childcare needs are in their lives and what supports they may already have in place through the YWCA, they may be able to get, you know, a family friend or an aunt reimbursed for taking care of their children through the YWCA. So, you know, even though we don't have the fix for it as a community college, we are connected to our community and we work with our community for the benefit of our students. Even just take going on an academic level, I feel like at the community college, you know, we are connected with business and industry leaders, right? All of the career and technical education programs have advisory committees. And so those community businesses are helping to shape our curriculum to make sure that our students are stepping into entry-level jobs prepared and with the skills that they need. They're partnering with them to create work-based learning, internships, all of those things that are going to be so critical for these students to be able to have those skills to step into job security and job stability that will maybe provide them with a way to forge their own path forward. One of the sayings that we hear here at Rock Valley College a lot is we are this community's college. And I think that that is something that's very special about our college, that we are embedded in our community. And we are looking out on our campus for the ways that we personally can help with things like a food pantry. We recently started a career closet where students can get clothing for interviews or internships or job shadows, things like that. You know, emergency funding, bus passes, gas cards, things like that. So we do what we can on campus, but then we rely on the folks in our community to help us extend that care. Yeah, I think all of the things that Anna listed are so important. And some of the other barriers that research and, you know, personal experience have shown to be true for this population in general is just the lack of support that these students have and the fact that they're navigating this road on their own. I think that one of the recommendations I made to Rock Valley and to every college that I speak to is to just to be really proactive with their communication around things like what supports are available on campus, be it like tutoring and academic support or financial, that kind of thing. And so putting the information in front of the students rather than, you know, making it difficult for them to find and putting it in a way that is easily digestible and understandable. 
especially in financial aid, it's so easy for us who have been working in the field for a long time to like know the language, use the acronyms and the technical terms. But the first time you're going through applying for financial aid as a student, it takes a while to understand those terms. And so if we can on a regular basis, be really proactive about making sure students understand what they're getting into financially and academically in all these different ways. I think that is really meaningful in helping students succeed on campus. I think it was something, Anna, something you mentioned in regards to the career tech ed path, these high skill, high wage jobs. And even going back to faculty, staff, people in the community, those partnerships, my thought is sometimes when we think college, the idea of earning a bachelor's degree, you know, go to the four year or even go and earn an associate's degree. Those are the two things that tend to stick out in folks' mind when they say go to college. But we know that there are great career in tech ed programs, especially you being a Perkins coordinator, that students and youth and individuals, adults returning, you know, after transitioning from career can transition into a new path within six to 24 months potentially and earn a significant increase in their income. I would like to spend a little time talking about some of the benefits to a career in tech ed program for students who have foster care experience. And what does that mean? How can we leverage, you know, that short, quick program to help our students transition from foster care to career or get them to see the value in some of the programs that we're offering and not just focus on associate degree or bachelor's degree, but there are so many pathways to becoming self-sustained, independent, earn an income post foster care. Can you all talk about that and what we need to do to amplify, increase awareness about some of the benefits of career and tech ed programs? Yeah, we have lots of students who transfer at Valley, but the programs that are career tech are highly supported. And in some ways, I think it's kind of a marketing challenge because, you know, students don't know what they don't know. So they may not be aware of the benefits of that short-term training, but I kind of feel like short-term training in a way is a community college's wheelhouse, you know, the number of programs we have, you put it so well, Chiquita, just, you know, six to 24 months and you could have this life altering career. One example is the WEI program, the Workforce Equity Initiative, which focuses on career tech areas. Some examples that she's doing are medical billing and coding, Mechatronic, CNA, and she has others. But if they're eligible for the program, they're eligible to receive weekly stipends, food and gas vouchers, housing assistance, child care assistance, completion stipends, along with other things. The tuition is covered. She's able to provide supplies. So there are sources of funding that are allowing students to very easily enter those short-term programs. You're talking about barriers, a disconnect between where the student is and getting them into that program, either because of lack of awareness or, as Kate was describing, just lack of support for navigating. But a lot of the programs that are similar to that include case management, they include career navigation, they include job placement services. So, you know, the dream is somebody enters the program, is supported while they're going through the program in such a way that they can complete, and then they're receiving assistance finding employment. So in some ways, I think one of our big jobs is to make sure students are aware of opportunities like that, and that the pathway from non-involvement to, you know, enrollment is as seamless as possible and as smooth as possible with staff supporting. But that's just one example. You know, there's many community colleges, all of us pretty much have ICAPS programs, which is a program that kind of marries adult education, GED and ESL with certificate and degree programs. So you have a co-located academic instructor that's providing academic support and there are wraparound supports. 
And then, of course, the Workforce Innovations and Opportunities Act, the WIOA programs, the one-stop centers, the Illinois WorkNet centers, they provide an enormous amount of case management, tuition, other supports for individuals who are seeking training to leading to careers. So I think part of it is simply a communication issue that we just need to make sure that individuals we're working with are aware of these opportunities. We did a focus group. This wasn't with the foster care population, but it was with students with housing insecurity or low income. One of the things they told us that was a barrier for them about entering community colleges was just, I don't think I know how to get into the door of, you know, the institution. How do I do that? How do I go from where I am to enrolled? So part of the work of Perkins and, you know, the institution and many wonderful people in At Rock Valley who are working toward change is making those inroads happen so that there is an on-ramp to community colleges. Yeah, I would just add to that with my experience with this population, you know, in Illinois, youth age out of foster care at age 21, typically, and that deadline is kind of looming for all of the teenagers that I work with. And it's difficult for them to like invest now in something like a four-year degree where they're not going to be really seeing the fruit of that labor for several years. And so a really straight path and a shorter path to a high earning job would just be, I think, very interesting to a lot of kids. It's something I'm learning from Rock Valley because, you know, my expertise is in the four-year world. So I'm learning from Rock Valley as much as they're learning from me. I would just mention as well that one of the great things about career and technical education is a lot of times there are stackable credentials. So for example, you could start out with a very quick path to a CNA certificate, and then you could be working in the field. And then the hospital system very well may pay for you to go back and get your nursing degree. Or if not, you'd probably qualify for WIOA funding, which could pay for your nursing degree. So there's a great opportunities to get in and out in the working field quickly, but that's not the ceiling, right? There's places to go from there. That's one step along your possible path. That's a really great point. Yeah. One of our engineering professors has said that she's seen students get their very, very basic certification and then spend some time working. And then they're in the place of employment and they're seeing someone else do a job. They're like, I could do that. So they go back and get that training. So, you know, setting up students in those systems so that they have the opportunity and the exposure to advancement. Hopefully they'll be lifelong learners and they'll keep coming to see us as they want further training. I love that. And the idea of being lifelong learners and stacking those credentials. And to your point, a lot of folks don't know that that is an option. And you bring up a great point in regards to advertisement, increasing that awareness and just wondering, you know, when we're looking at a population like youth and care on campus, what should community colleges consider when communicating and advertising these services and support specifically oh, <laughs> to ensure that population knows this is what I have available to me. This is what I can take advantage of without putting them on the spot. But how do we communicate to them? You know, commercials communicate to the people they want to attract, right? So how do we communicate to college students, former or current, that we have the services that you need? Okay, so here's the dream. One of the things that we've learned from our foster care agencies is that in many cases, it's a very good idea to reach out to youth who are in middle school, very young, because there may be a point of receptivity there. Not that there wouldn't be later, but that might be a good time. One of the plans that we have for this next fiscal year, fiscal year 24, is we're going to develop some marketing materials that are specifically designed for foster youth in care foster parents and foster care serving agencies so that students right away at that time can understand what the community college is, how welcome they are to come here, what they have to offer. One of our employees, our GED coordinator, Lori, has experience as a foster parent, and she was aware that many students who are removed from the home don't leave with much more than a garbage bag with their clothes. And so she said, what if we could find a way to get them backpacks so that they can have RVC backpack that the foster care agency can deliver to them at that time, and they can have that backpack. 
we kind of want to involve the college community in this. We want to do a drive to have people donate Rock Valley notebooks and pens and just a few specifically chosen goodies to go in that pack, as well as information about what the college is. One of our local agencies, we reached out to them when we got the idea, you know, we're learning that the first step is to go to them and say, hey, is this a good idea? (laughs) And they said, yes, you know, that would be wonderful. And there's, you know, a lot of foster care families have like a family discussion time where they talk about certain topics and the agencies provide activities. And they said, maybe there could be, you know, an activity book about careers. So they've given us a few ideas of things that could be supplied. So it's a little bit of a work in progress about what exactly is going to go in that backpack. But we would be delivering these backpacks full of information, full of love from Rock Valley College to these youth, to the agencies so that they can deliver them to the students at a point of time when they need them. And the dream is, you know, I'm saying, okay, this is FY24. So in FY30, I cannot wait to see the students who come to Rock Valley College because they got this backpack. That's so great. I love that. What you guys are describing Rock Valley doing is what we call in the college access world, creating a college going culture. And it's really important at a young age. It's like a recommendation for high schools. Like I was visiting my son's high school the other day and every teacher had on their sign, their classroom door, their name, the room number, and then also what college they went to and what they studied. You know, it's just kind of putting in the forefront of everyone's mind, all your teachers went to college and creating the awareness of like what the different options are and creating sort of this expectation. This is what we do here. We go to college. And I think it's really neat that you guys are actually doing that in a foster care agency, like that you're looping them into this idea of creating a college going culture for their entire foster care agency and then within their families as well. You're getting your brand in front of them, but then also just more generally the idea that, hey, the next step for you after high school is college potentially, because so few students who have experienced foster care actually have someone to say that to them, like to suggest, you know, there are a lot of biases against foster youth and what they're capable of. I met this woman who is such a phenomenal, professional, smart put together person. She is a lawyer. She teaches law in a law school. She also runs like her own little nonprofit on the side, just really, you know, a high achiever. And she grew up in foster care. And when she describes what she was like as a teenager, you know, no one could have predicted who she would ultimately become because she had experienced a lot of trauma, a lot of loss, a lot of hardship. Her family was homeless for a long time. As a teenager, you know, she describes like getting into fights, running away from home, getting kicked out, failing school. And so to know her now and to think like what she was like back then is just such a lesson for us, those of us who hold the keys to opportunity, to make sure that we're offering those keys to everyone because you just never know the most problematic child in foster care might end up being the next great lawyer who's turning around. And this woman too, she donates care packages to our students now who are in college and she sends them, you know, all these snacks and little gifts and also a note to be encouraging to them and say like, I know what it's like I was in your shoes. And it's just so meaningful. So I think it's really great that you all are creating that college going culture for the agencies, the families, the whole community. It's really cool. And not only just creating the college going culture, but now we're saying when you get here, we have a campus friendly culture that welcomes you because it's one thing to say, we welcome you here. It's another to say, now that you hear, we got your back. We want to provide the resources for you because it's nothing worse than inviting someone over for dinner and you didn't prepare the meal. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And you know, a couple of things that are very cool. One of the ideas we have for something to put in the backpack is involving some student clubs to write letters to them because it is true that there's stigma, you know, adult education students also have a stigma where they absolutely are very little different than most college students, you know, because they lack a GED or came with an English language need, you know, they're working so hard in adult education to gain those basic skills. And in many cases, lots of community colleges have these stories, but they'll come to college more prepared 
but there's this stigma, you know, a GED student or an ESL student, you know, but we know it's not true, you know, so the students who are at Rock Valley College, even if they don't have experience in foster care, I'm sure they can tell students inspiring stories about how they came to college, you know, how they connected with community college, how possible it was. So having those notes and then our colleges, our institution is also talking about peer mentors, you know, those kinds of things, embedded tutors. There's ways that, you know, once a foster care individual has entered the college that they will find staff support and peer support. This has truly been a rich conversation. As we prepare to wrap up, I would like for you to think about some closing thoughts you would want to share with our listeners today, specifically those who are saying, you know what, I want that at our institution. And it might be an advisor that's listening who may feel like, I don't even know where to start. You know, I'm just an academic advisor, but I have these students I need to serve. Or someone like Kate, who is community-based and saying, I need to send students to partner with this institution, but I don't know where to start. How can we, you know, create this culture at our community colleges in Illinois and not just create it, but sustain it and make sure that it is thriving? So what thoughts would you offer to a listener who's saying, okay, I hear you, but what can I do? I think it takes having at least one person on campus, like a Trisha or an Anna, who is dedicated to this particular cause or population. And it takes that person just coordinating some things like trainings and like on-campus programming and the communication that's going out. It's work. The relationship building, the activity planning, like it takes time and it takes a specific dedicated person. And so that's why I think it was so important that that legislation passed that said that we need a liaison on every college campus. It doesn't apply to like private colleges. So for those folks who are listening, I would just say like, even if the law doesn't apply to you, you can still do that. You can dedicate at least one person to the particular population. And then I would also say there's turnover on campuses and in agencies and things like that. And so It's just making sure that you're doing some succession planning and passing the baton on so that when one cohort leaves, the next one is ready to take over the reins. It's people, you know, the work, it takes people doing it. I would say that we've been so fortunate that the institution has really wholeheartedly been behind the Perkins Special Populations efforts that we've put together. You know, early on, we cobbled together a group of people who had shown interest, and we did a professional development session that was mandatory, where we basically introduced the different special populations and talked to them about what the barriers are, what kind of support would be helpful, what the numbers were in Illinois, what the numbers were on our campus, just to kind of get that awareness. And then from that point of just kind of providing the initial information, we had people who were like, I want to be part of this. And so then it's not just one person, you know, heaven forbid, if I was not able to show up to work tomorrow, I know that there's a whole group of people who have grown over time and they can continue this work. They can keep it going. It's great because Perkins has that equity piece so embedded in it. So whoever would step into my role would find themselves having to wrangle with this pretty quickly. But I think it's so important to have a wide base of support. And that really is just a word of mouth, inviting people to be part. Do you know anybody who might be willing, who might be interested? And people start coming out of the woodwork because I think people have passions that they want to invest their time and effort into. And I think we're giving them opportunities to find that space for you, find the people and the students that you're passionate about their success and finding solutions for problems, removing barriers and finding supports that can just enable their success. My advice would be call Kate. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Yes. And find your local agencies and get connected with them. You know, if you have that point person like Kate saying campuses can have those people You know, I think that they are our teachers. They're our lighthouses. They are who we will rely on to make sure that we're doing a good job and doing things that they need us to do. Yes, call Kate. (laughs) (laughs) Love it. I echo that. You just call Kate needs to be a (laughs) t-shirt. Because the work is great and the work that you all are doing, the partnership that 
just started with a phone call. It started with calling Kate. And we say that jokingly, but sometimes it's the simplest things. It's that pebble in the pond that creates the greatest ripples. And so the work that you all are doing with Foster Progress and Rock Valley is definitely commendable. And it serves as a blueprint for those who are interested. So thank you ladies so much for sharing. We could continue to have this conversation. We could continue to go on and on because it's such a rich work. But we thank you so much for sharing with our audience today. Great conversation. And we look forward to hearing about all the great outcomes that will emerge from this partnership that's already creating ripples in the field of education and child welfare. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you so much for having thank us, Chiquita. Background music for this podcast was provided by Fast Sounds from the website Pixabay. Thank you for listening and for your contributions to equity, justice, and excellence in education for all students.